Welcome, viewers, and to those of you joining us through the various platforms this discussion is on. Um, my name is Mina al and I am the editor of The National, and I am based here in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Delighted that for our conversation entitled Peace as a Paradigm Shift, a New Era of UAE-Israeli Cooperation, I have with me His Excellency Omar Saif Kubash, Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation for Cultural Affairs from the UAE. However, His Excellency is in Washington as we speak, and in true COVID-19 era fashion, we are doing this socially distanced, but very much connected. Your Excellency, welcome. Thank you very much, Mina. I'm delighted you had time to do this. I know it's been a very busy schedule as you arrived in Washington DC uh, yesterday on Sunday, and will be there for the historic signing tomorrow of the peace treaty between the UAE and Israel. The Abraham Accords were announced in August and really were quite a historic moment for the UAE, for Israel, for the United States, and for the region. Um, 2020 for many people will be marked by COVID-19 and all the implications it's had. Unfortunately, for too many people, it will mean a somber moment due to either ill health, losing loved ones, losing jobs, losing livelihoods. In the UAE, we've had a different kind of year. We've had an exciting launch of the HOPE Mars probe. We've had the start of the first uh, nuclear power station in the Arab world, Baraka. And of course, we've now had a peace uh, treaty being signed tomorrow and peace accords announced between the UAE and Israel. So here to discuss with us, um, His Excellency Omar Gobash, uh, will tell us what this means for the UAE and for the region. Please tell us your views before I start into my many questions for you. Right. Well, on, on a personal note, it's um, you know a tremendous uh, a moment. I'm really personally uh, honored to have been invited uh, by by um, Sheikh Abdullah to attend the signing of the uh, accord. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's something that I've always looked forward to, uh, and perhaps like many. Um, Emiratis and many Gulf Arabs. Um, this is something that you know I've always wondered about, uh, but never really been able to speak about. So it feels like a huge taboo has been removed from the way in which we can look at the uh, uh, the Arab world uh, at ourselves as well. And I think one of the interesting things is um, the number of young Emiratis in particular who have uh, spoken to me or, or or let me know how excited they are, how interested they are in Israel. Uh, how they want to learn about the, the the people and the language and how how they want to travel there. So it's uh, just you know from a kind of a, a sociological perspective, it's interesting to see how these taboos have operated in our lives, and and how uh, easily that they've been removed and and you know we see what happens next. So I wanted to ask you: Do you take this as a significant change, a marked change for the UAE, or is it a natural next step? You know, I think um, the decision in itself is a marked change because it sent a very powerful signal uh, to the region and, you know, uh, further afield that um, we are uh, a state that respects its own decision making, that respects its own interests, or respects its own sovereignty, and is very, very uh, aware of its sovereignty. Uh, and that, you know, for, for possibly one of the first times in our part of the world, we have a state that is actually saying, look, I have. I have Arab loyalties, I have Islamic loyalties, but I also have my own interests and the interests of my population and the interests of my state. Uh, and we're actually, what we're doing is we're putting our sovereignty, our interests first um, in, in a way that has surprised many of our partners in the region and some of our enemies in the region as well. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we're taking back decision making. Uh, into our own hands, where in the past we we will we will have outsourced any relationship with the Israelis to the Palestinians and to the so-called frontline states. I think this is um, in itself it's a very powerful sovereignty of uh, self-interest of of uh, a desire to solidify kind of the base of the state, but at the same time it's a reflection of a long um, a long-term change that was taking place not just in the Emirates but across the um, the Gulf states, um, we've moved from being populations that were poorly educated to being populations that are highly educated. Now that in itself doesn't mean that you have to go and make peace with Israel, but it does mean that we will now look at um, regional issues in a different light. 
no longer driven by ideology, no longer driven solely by political considerations. We also are driven by economic imperatives. We're, inter we're, we're driven by uh, cultural and social imperatives as well. Uh, and we have a recognition of our demographics as well, where we have young populations that have aspirations. Now, my generation is a population was a population whose aspirations were not really central. There, there was state building, there was you know, sort of basic economic development. But now we have kids who have a desire to live a life and a complex life. We have complex economy, we have niches, we have all kinds of things going on. And that creates a different kind of impetus. It means that we need to be connecting in a global economy with global players. We can't be a global player as we wish if we don't connect with other global hubs. And Israel is without doubt one of, one of those hubs, um, a, a technological hub and a political hub. Um, and and it's, it's for those reasons, I think that uh, what we've done is both natural and shocking as well. You mentioned the word taboo, and I think that's really quite interesting because you know, in societies all over the world, there are certain issues that are seen as taboo that you can't broach them. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that discussing issues to do with Israel, to do with, um, you know, what does peace look like and so forth was often seen as taboo. And so, but very quickly, we've seen a step change in, in how people reference um, relations with Israel. So do you think that that's because that's, as you said, people used to talk about this behind closed doors and now feel comfortable? to talk about this and feel that it's it's a natural progression? Or do you think it's more a case of people are, are still in wait and see mode that want to see how quickly the the formal uh, relationship goes and then people will will pick up speed? Yeah, good, good question. And, and I, I think, you know, I've, I've been wondering about this too. I mean, I was surprised by some of the kind of enthusiasm that, that came out online in particular. Um, but, the, you know, a few years ago, I made a speech where I talked about anti-Semitism in the Arab world to an Arab audience. And I had you know, been somewhat reticent about speaking about it because, you know, there are sensitivities, the, the overlap between uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment. Uh, and the response from the audience, which was a Muslim Arab audience, was actually we should be addressing this issue because anti-Semitism uh, separated from the political question of Israel is actually something that affects our moral health, our ethical health. Uh, and so that's when I began to get an inkling that actually the, the relationship with Israel, the relationship with Judaism is actually much more nuanced than, uh, say, you know, the, the public rhetoric um, that we grew up with uh, um, uh, suggested. Uh, so I, um, I think that there will be some people who are uh, waiting to see what happens next. I think also there's going to be a pace at which this relationship develops. Uh, and, you know, my, my experience of relationships is that there is initial euphoria, there's initial excitement. Uh, uh, you know, both sides will have both stereotypes about the other, as well as uh, uh, fantasies about what can be achieved. Um, and then, you know, we'll all hit reality, which is, you know, we're, we all live in the same kind of societies, the same kind of, you know, economic and, and cultural environments, and, and nobody's going to be taken for a fool. So. Uh, I think that's that's the bit when it gets really interesting, when the hard work of actually connecting begins. Um, and just a little earlier today, I spoke to an, um, an Israeli delegation that is in Dubai, and uh, they, they came with one of the largest banks uh, in Israel to sign a, a deal with, not a deal, a memorandum of understanding with one of the leading banks in the UAE. Um, and they were very interested also in understanding what they could expect um, because again, there is this rush to say, oh, well, you know, our, our technology, our education, our knowledge can marry along, uh, marry your, your wealth funds and, and so on. Uh, and, you know, that, that's a sort of a marriage made in heaven. But I think actually we'll find that, you know, there's going to be a lot, a, a lot of uh, caution and reticence um, uh, in the long run. So we need to work at, at breaking that down. I mean, so many, so many issues to pick up with you from that because you're right in terms of you know the, these are going to be steps and there'll be certain very natural areas of cooperation and others that will take time. So I guess what would be your message to young Israelis who have never come to the Gulf region and of course will be now coming to the UAE? We've heard, of course, that Bahrain is also establishing ties with Israel. So what would your message be to to young Israelis? Uh, I think you know, it'll be interesting for us to, to see how they look at us. I mean, um, for, for 
a certain sector of young Israelis, I think that they will also have some very clear stereotypes about what to expect um, from from us. I mean, you know, the, the, there are the typical Gulf stereotypes about wealth uh, and, and, and about knowledge. Um, and then, then there are the, the historical experience of peace with Jordan uh, and, and Egypt, uh, which were very cold, um, you know, let's, let, to be blunt, they were not particularly uh, warm uh, uh, forms of peace, and there wasn't much people-to-people -people interaction. Now, I think what they'll find is that young Emiratis in particular are, uh, you know, sort of global in outlook, uh, are excited about learning new things, love to travel, uh, and love to experience new, new experiences. Uh, and that you know they they should they should be ready for a, a large number of Emirati tourists uh, turning up uh, all, all across Israel. So I think they should they should um, you know as a diplomat I've spent a lot of time in, in the last few years trying to differentiate between what we are and what you know sort of the broader Arab uh, world is. And you know there are there are no um, there's no single type of 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 Arab that that exists. We are so different in many ways. Um, and and that's what they they should expect. That actually, you know, they'll find that uh, there's this tremendous amount of uh, commonality and outlook and aspiration, uh, and it's just going to be you know, really fascinating going forward. Now, of course, there is the issue of Palestine, the aspirations of young Palestinians also. Uh, many Palestinians yeah. that yearn for the day they can have their own state, uh, the continued occupation of Palestine. The UAE has been very clear in its continued support for a two-state solution and its call for the establishment of Palestinian state. So I want to ask you, what do you say to young Palestinians um, who may be watching you, who, of course, heard from Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed himself, who spoke about the historic relationship um, with Palestinians yeah, yeah. that continue? I want to ask you, what's your message to young Palestinians particularly? Uh, young Palestinians particularly, uh, our our loyalty to the Palestinian cause is no weaker today than it was uh, over the last 40, 48 years. Um, we are deeply committed to um, a Palestinian statehood and to the Palestinian cause and to justice for the for the Palestinian people, wherever they are. Uh, there, there, there is potentially, um, uh, I suppose, to, uh, how to, uh, there, there is a disconnect that we, we, we see between the Palestinian cause and, say, Palestinian leadership, which is factionalized, uh, and, and 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 subject to many many different um, kind of uh, constraints and, and pressures. Uh, our uh, peace with Israel will uh, serve the Palestinian cause in ways that um, we cannot predict today. Uh, but there are ways in which I think it can directly, in that we uh, as a as a major economy and as a major player in the Middle East and with our relationships globally. We will be able to stand inside the the tent of the Palestinian issue and actually make statements and put pressure where it concerns the Palestinians in Palestinian uh, in in uh, in the favor of the Palestinians. Um, there we have, uh, I, I suppose, upended a logic that uh, that were dominated uh, our discourse for a long time, which was that the Gulf states are a sort of gift to give the Israelis after the establishment of the Palestinian state. Well, that that approach, uh, uh, you know, it basically takes away any agency from the Gulf states. And uh, we basically are signaling that that kind of approach um, is, is over. We are agents of our own uh, fate. Uh, we will fight for our own interests. And we will, uh, what, what looks like betrayal is actually another uh, example of, of greater loyalty. We will better be, be, be able to serve the Palestinian cause by having the direct relationship, by having the economic and commercial ties with the Israelis, than by standing outside the tent and waiting for, uh, you know, sort of history to take its course. As you said, a lot has been appended by changing the dynamic, the discourse, the stagnation that had enveloped uh, the Palestinian cause and the Arab-Israeli relationship. So, you know, tomorrow there will be the signing of the first agreement in over a quarter of a century between Israel and an Arab nation, in this case, of course, it's the UAE. And so I wanted to ask you, how does this change the region? Yeah, um, it's interesting because, you know, many people will say that, you know, we've we've uh, signed this deal with the Israelis either for American defense equipment or to, you know, sort of ally against uh, regional powers uh, or, you know, for purely economic reasons or because, you know, we have no respect uh, for Arab causes 
all of that is is is, is incorrect. Um, the UAE is a country that really um, looks. It, it, you know, I've I've said this a number of times, and, and leadership has also emphasised this tremendously. We're we're a, we're a nation that that focuses on the present um, and and looks to the future. We're interested. In, you know, our government is deeply committed to. Uh, uh, to thinking about um, problems and to solving them, not just at a local level, but at a global level. We would like uh, ultimately to become a global player, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, even though we're, we're not one of the largest countries in the world, um, it is uh, our ability to identify and to solve problems uh, in, in a tough region um, that will, be, will, will allow us to play that global role. Um, the... Lead, leadership in the Palestinian, well, it's, uh, perhaps, perhaps we go on to the next question. I've, I've lost my train of thought though. There well, were so well, many trains. There are, there, I mean, there is so much to talk about because as we said, it, it changes so much in the region, but at the same yeah. time, it tells us a lot about the UAE and the UAE's approach to looking at the, understanding the past, but looking towards the future and saying, mm. how can we get out of let's say, almost cul-de-sacs or corners that have been created and try to forge a different way. And so I guess my next question for you is that, what does that look like in terms of opportunities? If you can drill down into a bit more specific uh, detail about the sorts of opportunities you hope will be created by um, this new relationship. Um, I think that some, some of the obvious ones are, you know, so the logistics connection that we'll be able to form with Israel. And, uh, you know, there, there was a discussion this, this morning about specifically uh, that, about the ports and the airports of, of Israel. Uh, and I, I think it's um, kind of amusing uh, also, you know, with a slight political kind of uh, twist here. Um, the, the Turks were very un unhappy with our um, uh, relationship with Israel. Uh, and yet, of course, you know, the, the Turks have had a relationship with Israel since 1949. Um, and I discovered recently that actually um, Israel is one of the major hubs for uh, Turkish airlines um, flying to the Far East. Uh, and, you know, the fact that there might be an economic argument that they would make against, uh, I mean, the Turks to make against uh, the Emirates um, may have something to do with, um, with, with that situation. Uh, I think um, there's the technologies that we see coming out of Israel. Um, they, we, they're, they're world famous for um, having developed some of the most amazing technologies. Um, I think we would like uh, to um, get involved in the financing of some of those technologies, but also in technology transfer and educational transfer uh, to the Emirates. And I, I believe the um, Mohammed bin Zayed um, University of Artificial Intelligence just recently signed with the Weizmann Institute um a, a, a cooperation on students and and education and courses um so that's very exciting uh i think that there are, there are so many different ways in which we could potentially benefit it'd be interesting to see what an israeli entrepreneur would do in dubai uh or abu dhabi um what, how would they view uh, the set of kind of issues and potential solutions um, that they might offer and on the other hand you know it might be interesting to see what uh, emirati entrepreneurs would do uh um, with the with the uh, opportunities in Israel as well, so I think you know it's uh, it's just it's a question of imagination and and how far you want to go with it. I want to go back to a point that you spoke about, which is the issue of anti-Semitism, the issue of identity. Um, you know, and also at the same time, for many Arabs, it's it's an issue, an issue of you know the Palestinian cause was a point to rally around, and we see so much fragmentation. Um, that this was one of the almost last uh, pinnacles of, of, at least on the surface, of agreement. Let's all agree on this issue. But there have been shifting sands now. And one of those is more and more people in this region who don't want to be defined in the public sphere by religion, rather that this is a private matter and it's their identity. Yeah. Private. So I want to talk to you about that, like how this changes um, some of identity politics in the region, but also importantly for people, how they identify. And the UAE has really pushed this agenda of tolerance and spoken about, you know, we've discussed the, the, the term necessarily tolerance yeah. is not always understood in the same way in English as it is in Arabic, tasamuh, but this idea of, of working, living together and peaceful coexistence. Tell me about the UAE's vision for that and how this, um, the Abraham Accords, fit into that, that thinking and that approach that has been going on for years now. Just on the subject of tolerance, I actually think that that is already a high enough standard. I know that 
Um, uh, some some people who object to the word tolerance, you know, want to have a, a, a much more a much friendlier world. But I actually, you know, um, uh, my opinion of uh, fellow human beings is is not astoundingly high. I think tolerance is already a, a superb achievement. If we can get that far, then we will have gone a long way. Uh, you know, so sort of more broadly, uh, the effect that it's going to have on our, our sense of identity is that, well, I think it's actually a reflection that our identities are much more complex than I'm an Arab, therefore I have to do X, Y, Z, and I'm a Muslim, therefore these are my three or four key beliefs. Uh, I think um, we are just going to find perhaps that discourse becomes much more interesting and complex. Uh, we're going to discover that uh, Arabs don't actually have to agree, and there is this kind of almost a, a religious uh, edict that says all Arabs must agree on everything. Uh, um, and in fact, it would be wonderful if we could agree to disagree uh, and, and, and sort of you know, move on from there. Uh, and I think we are actually coming to that stage. Um, once we have a, clear, a clearer sense of, of uh, sovereignty and personal kind of um, uh, autonomy, it then becomes easier to say, okay, well, I have done this. This is what I believe. This is what we believe is right for us you in turn may find that you believe other things and you know we will respect that um you know as long as it obviously it doesn't affect our our uh, existential safety um i think you know that's that's where we're heading uh, to be honest and it will also be interesting as time goes by i mean the bahrainis have now said that they will sign an agreement there are rumors that other arab countries are going to be doing that it'll be interesting to look at why each country has made that decision and what it is that each of those countries would expect to change both internally and and you know some more broadly regionally now we we're also looking towards the opening of the abrahamic house uh, here yeah. in in the uae of course we had the monumental visit of the pope to the uae last year and there's been a lot of talk yeah. about the importance of what unites um the children of abrahamic faiths is, is actually much more than what divides them so tell me a bit more about the UAE's approach to that and, and the importance of the Abrahamic house. Yeah, this is where I think our, our leadership has been extraordinarily um, creative, imaginative, and, and courageous. Because already when uh, we announced um, uh, the Abrahamic family house, uh, I, I personally was overwhelmed with emotion and, and overjoyed with the idea that we would have three uh, mm -hmm. houses of worship, a, a mosque, a church, uh, and, a, and a synagogue. And to be honest, I mean, uh, uh, people like me thought that that was already such a great achievement. That was already such a great statement. Um, very difficult to have imagined that there would be another step where we'd actually, you know, reach out to the Israelis to, to sign peace, a peace accord with them. Now, um, it's, it's interesting also that if we can, we can remove that, possibly the largest taboo in the, in the Arab mind, uh, then, then pretty much everything is possible and everything is up for discussion, I'd say. Uh, and that again is something very exciting. A, it, it links in with the idea of, of, of tolerance that has been um, you know, adopted and promoted um, by the Emirates leadership for the last few years, um, you know, with the naming of a ministry of tolerance and then the year of tolerance. Uh, and it's, it's exciting to see how, um, you know, you take this label of tolerance and then you begin to express it with the uh, Abrahamic family house, with the you know, uh, outreach to Israel, and I, I'm going to be, you know, sort of fascinated to see what comes next as a result of these very brave decisions. Part of what comes next is, as you said, this is a people-to-people -people kind of relationship that's being built. So cultural diplomacy is something you've been incredibly involved in. Um, tell me what your thoughts are in terms of cultural diplomacy with Israel, but also where this places the UAE globally in terms of cultural diplomacy. Well, for, for some time now, I mean, you, you know that we've we've got art fairs in the Emirates, uh, and we have a you know sort of a large and active uh, cultural sector, uh, galleries all over the all over the country, and you know it's it's, it's kind of been a, a secret for some time, but a number of those galleries have actually um, uh, done very well by selling Arab and and, and Middle Eastern art to uh, big Israeli collectors. So that is something that now may come out into the open. Um, I think there will be an inter a great deal of interest. Um, purely on the cultural level for Israelis to come and see uh, what it is that we've been doing, how it is that we express ourselves, what are our concerns, and you know um, uh, how they can participate. Um, I think there'll be a lot of that. I think also, I mean, we, we're now speaking to the department within the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so their public diplomacy department, 
Uh, and we're looking at sort of academic exchanges uh, and you know sort of youth exchanges, trips back and forth. Of course, you know we need to we need to um, make sure that COVID is out of the way first. But um, there's a tre tremendous amount of enthusiasm. Um, and uh, you know, from my perspective within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, I'm just wondering whether we'll be able to um, play any role in this because kids are already uh, so excited about um, about it. Uh, there, you know, there's interest, I think, on both sides um, uh, in terms of language. Uh, I know certainly a number of Emiratis have either you know, demonstrated proficiency in Hebrew or are looking to study Hebrew um, and to discover more about the way in which Israelis look at the world and think about the world. And I think, you know, just a, at a kind of a fundamental level, Israel, Israel being this um, um, kind of mythical tech uh, state in our neighborhood in the middle east having taken you know sort of having developed technologies in agriculture and uh, uh and, and and further um it's interesting to see how the, the, there'll be sort of cross-pollination uh with uh, our tech entrepreneurs as well in in the emirates and, and in the broader gulf and i think one one of the issues that for many um palestinians that that doesn't come out as much as that this doesn't happen to exclude the Palestinians. This just means, as you said, that the tent is wider because for many Palestinians, they found the UAE as a home, um, cultural yeah. diplomacy, but also in, in business have, have really um, been able to thrive here. But I guess I just, I want to come back to the point that, you know, it doesn't mean that one side has to exclude the other. Um, sure. And how do you approach that? Like, how do you make sure that message is there, that, that of course, we're all talking about the UAE-Israeli relationship because that's the new one. So it's natural that that's you know that's yeah. the old potential. In addition to, as you said, Israel has these many sectors that the UAE is interested in. Um, so if we can, yeah, how, how well, we yeah. It, uh, that, that's actually a, a very important question because uh, in in the way I talk about the relationship and in the way certain you know other representatives of the uh, Emirates talk about the relationship, our focus is really on the relationship with Israel. Um, and there is, you know, not as much reference to Palestine uh, or the Palestinians as one might hope or, or expect. And, and the reason is, yes, it, because, you know, it's the relationship with Israel that is the, the, the new element here. Um, and it's the dynamics between uh, the, the Emiratis and the Israelis that is going to be interesting. But uh, I think also we need to be, you know, bear in mind that, that there are uh, almost two million um, Israeli citizens who are actually um, Palestinian, uh, and uh, they form a part of Israel. And I am uh, absolutely positive that the Emirates, in its relationship with Israel, will be very interested in uh, interacting with the um, Palestinian Israelis as well to find out what has their experience been, how do they stand on the question of peace. How do they see, you know, the 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 question of of Judaism and 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 Israel? So the the Palestinian, uh, in our view, the Palestinian question can is not represented solely by, um, you know, the Palestinian Authority or by uh, Hamas in Gaza. Um, there there are many many Palestinian voices that need to be heard by not just by the Emiratis but by the rest of the the Arab world. So. Um, in that sense, that, that will come uh, with time once we have an embassy, once we have a presence there, uh, and once we have Palestinian Israelis coming to, to the UAE as well. So it's, it's, it's going to be a, a really fascinating and exciting uh, uh, time to find out what's, what's really going on in Israel. So I, I want to talk about the actual ceremony, the sign ceremony tomorrow. Um, a lot of us are curious as to what it will be like. So I want to ask you first, not so much as your excellency going there as an official, but as you, Amar, who um, have always spoken very candidly, what does it mean to you to go and attend this ceremony um, and, and actually see, witness a historic moment like that? Right, well, uh, yeah, there, there is a, a bit of uh, humor here. Um, of course, you know, the, the ceremonies at the White House uh, uh, have been famous for being no mosque ceremonies. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm I'm planning to bring extra masks for anybody who needs them. So um, we're we're going to be all covered up. Uh, that's that's number one. Number two is that you know it's it's almost surreal to be honest. You know, if, if, if you, a few days ago I was I was in the Emirates and then all of a sudden I get a message saying you know pack your bags you're going to DC. So for me personally it's uh, it's it's a massive honor and and uh, I'm I'm so excited to uh, get the opportunity to actually be there. Um, you know, we, we have our Bahraini uh, colleagues who will also be there. So, you know, there may be a bit of crowding on the on the stage. 
Um, and uh, I've got extra pens just in case uh, we run out of ink for the signing. So uh, just to make sure. I knew there was a good reason you were there. <laughs> so I want to ask you about diplomacy because unfortunately we've seen too many times when diplomacy hasn't succeeded in the region. But this is a diplomatic moment. It's a moment where say you can have triumph and you can actually, as you said, disagree on certain political issues, but then still see reasons to to build bridges with another country. Tell me what you think this means for UAE diplomacy. Uh, I think it's a major uh, step forward for, for UAE diplomacy. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been in and out of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 1993, and I've seen the evolution of um, our sense of self, uh, our sense of uh, sovereignty, our sense of uh, agency, and it's really, really got, it's, 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 it's an 100, 180 degree turn. Um, and this is um, a moment of, for me, real and national pride, pride, not necessarily in signing a deal with um, the Israelis, but pride that we take steps uh, to ensure our interests are served. Um, and that allows us to then be a more uh, powerful state, a more stable state, a more kind of uh, a solid state that allows us then to look at others, you know? So uh, in a way, so the, 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 uh, the, I was going to say the method, um, the, the, the saying that, you know, charity begins at home, essentially it does. Strengthen ourselves, then we can go out and help our friends. Um, and uh, that's that's something that our young diplomats will need to take into account and to understand that, you know, the state is moving at a certain rate. Our diplomats need to also move at, at that rate, or if not faster, in being able to explain, being able to verbalize, being able to defend the actions of our state um and and do so with conviction and pride so that that point about um young diplomats you also wrote um a wonderful book called letters um to a young muslim um, you. and i wanted to ask you that because you said you wrote that because you you were actually addressing it to your son you want to talk about how the future could be and that comes in line with what you're saying about young emirati diplomats where their their present and their future will be markedly different from that of the past 20, 30, 40 decades. So tell me um, more about that that journey of writing about uh, you know addressing young Muslims and also how this tees up with the Abraham Accords, but also with the UAE's visionary future thinking. Sounds like I'm going to have to write a PhD for you, Amina. <laughs> well, you've got about five minutes to do, to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it actually seems like a lifetime ago because I wrote the book and published it in 2017. So, you know, sort of at the, at the peak of ISIS domination of, of you know, sort of public uh, media and, and territory in, in Syria and Iraq. Uh, and I was I was really at a loss there. I really thought that, you know, the, 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 this was such a, a an, an awful and tragic and, and miserable way for the for the Arab world to develop or the Muslim world to develop. And it seems like such a lifetime away. Um, uh, but, but nevertheless, I mean, the, the key messages that I had in that book for, for young people was to really to trust themselves, to trust yourself as a young person, uh, to know that you, you, you can tell the difference between right and wrong. Um, and that, and that, that, you know, there are older people who are out, you know, to, um, instrumentalize you, you know, to use your existence to further their goals. And I always uh, wanted to see, you know, at least the Emirates, if not the wider region as a nation of individuals who. Um, believe in, in uh, strongly in their country, but also believe strongly in their personal autonomy, their ability to make decisions, uh, their ability to craft their own life, and I think uh, um, uh, and to design their own life. And I think that's where uh, our, our society is actually going. And uh, and you know the state is kind of exemplifying that. There are so many ways in which what the Emirates has done, going back to 2006, um, has been to say, look, you know, these, this is what our, our traditional interests look like, but we're going to go off in this direction as well, because we need to know that we can do many things, not just one thing. And 2006 is, uh, I believe, the year that uh, the renewable energy um, uh, program was started, uh, which went completely against the hydrocarbon logic of our economy. Um, and, you know, the Pope's visit was, again, it goes completely against um, the, 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 the taboo of, uh, 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 of foreign religions, other religions on the Arabian Peninsula, and as well, you know, so the Abrahamic family house. So there are so many things that our uh, government and our leadership has done to break those, those mental kind of uh, structures. Uh, I think young people should see this as an opportunity also to, to you know, 
uh, the, the traditional saying of thinking outside the box. Go ahead, because the box is being broken. It's being redesigned completely. Uh, and then it's, I, I would be, you know, it's an exciting time to be a young person in the Emirates. And part of that redesign will be on display in full force with Expo next year. Uh, yeah. Now, we are so used to saying Expo 2020, and I guess it still is Expo 2020, because we're all going to pretend this year didn't happen. I'm going to be a year younger next year. Um, and so as, as we look towards 2020, but Expo really is going to be, I mean, the, the pillars of Expo, talking about mobility, sustainability, and opportunity, those three pillars for where the UAE stands. And again, um, I'd like to hear from you how you that, that vision for Expo, but also, you know, we knew that the UAE invited all countries, all UN yeah. member states to Expo, and that included Israel. And that was from, from yeah. last year. And it was one of those things that, again, you know, it was reported, there wasn't this sort of, you know, immediate backlash of, you know, why is this happening? Because it, it was, as you said, as the UAE is a global power and a global um, a player, then, then you can't have an international event and decide to exclude even other countries that you may not get at home, not only Israel, at home. So I want to ask you about Expo. Next year, as we look towards Expo, we have Abrahamic reports here, but also, as you said, that redesign. How will that come into play next year? Yeah, well, I think now, I mean, it's uh, given what happened with the with the postponement of Expo and 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 with COVID and all of the different kind of uh, the the realignment of government to focus on on the um, on economic development and small and medium sized businesses, on even greater connectivity, uh, you know, in terms of food security, in terms of um, uh, medical uh, and health security, uh, you know, it, it's it's just amazing to be able to see that and. Uh, the, the, what, what our government is doing is, it is, I think the expression is to turn on a dime. Uh, the, the idea that you can change direction as soon as you spot a structural shift. Uh, this is, it's, it's not a, a massive kind of ship or, or um, a container ship that you need to take time to turn around. We turn around in the, in the course of a few weeks. Um, and that, that's what's very exciting to see um, the way in which you know we were we went from broadly political Arab issues to focusing immediately on those elements uh, that we need to strengthen ourselves on. So again, food security, water security, um, uh, and and health. Um, I I think that you know the uh, Expo 2020 will be a reflection of uh, a changing set of of interests, uh, and I think you know we we'd love to see our, our like, your fellow Arab states begin to think in that way as well because it's going to it's going to improve the state of of the common arab and it's going to improve the state of, of of the arab world um you know you, you you have to break a taboo perhaps to 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 see what's possible um and i hope that you know what we have done and what we're doing um will play out in that way that it will actually be seen as you know a controversial step but a very positive step as well uh, and not one built in uh, out, uh, sort of built out or constructed out of um, uh, selfishness. Self-interest is different from selfishness. We're not turning our back on the Arab world. We're not turning our back on the Muslim world. In fact, what we're doing is we're strengthening our position to serve um, uh, those those causes even more. You know, it's interesting what you're saying. The difference between selfishness and self-interest, and also setting aside slogans, because I think too much of our 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 immediate past, but also our future could be found in, in empty slogans that unfortunately the Palestinians have been the first victims of. Yeah. Um, only those who, who, could, who, who declared that they were defending Palestine or defending the Arab cause actually did, would be in a different um, world. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so that, that takes me to the point about the UAE's approach to, to policy making, but also to its relationships with others. That kind of very open but um, clear and transparent approach when it comes to themes. So whether it's public health and the interest of the in public health in, in Africa, for example, is something that I think many people don't know about. Likewise, um, agriculture and the interest with with those sectors. So how does the Abraham Accord and the, the, the peace agreement with Israel help to serve that wider agenda um, that the UAE has been pushing? Uh, you know, one of the um, sort of sentences that I came across in the last few hours um, about, uh, you know, so within our own internal documentation was uh, about the uh, Abrahamic Accord is that um, we would hope to work with Israel on bringing some of these benefits, these potential benefits to the rest of the Arab world. The, this is not purely for the benefit of 
Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Al Khaimah, the UAE. Um, the, you know, it, the primary focus would be to pull in uh, benefit for ourselves, but it is then the spirit of the UAE and the spirit of leadership in the UAE to take those benefits and to share them as much as possible. And I think you know you, you can see that from the daily, almost daily announcements um, of our uh, um, the Emirati donations to other countries um, for for COVID. Uh, uh, there's a huge amount of aid going out to different countries, you know, um, almost kind of without without uh, uh, distinguishing between friend and foe. So there there is a, uh, the instinct to give, um, but we, in order to give, we have to we have to we have to build ourselves even more, and that's what um, I see that our government and our leadership um, and even our business community are interested in. Um, we're gonna we're gonna connect. We're gonna connect as well as we can. Um, and you know we we have the leadership to do it. So um, we're unbelievably running out of time. I thought I'd, I'd have much more time um, to ask you even more questions, but I have two final questions before we wrap up. And my first is tomorrow, as an editor, I have to come up with a headline coming out from the signing. So I'm going to ask you to help me write the headline. What is the headline oh, to take away from tomorrow's important signing? Uh, I I really believe it's a new era. Um, it's a new era for Emiratis. Um, in one way or another, it's a new era for the, the Gulf states uh, because we are so similar in outlook, because we are so similar in the kinds of uh, economic and, and, and social structures. Um, I'm not saying that anybody else is going to sign peace, but um, there is uh, what we are doing is a reflection of where we all are. So a new era. Um, and you know, not necessarily an era that's going to be particularly easy. Uh, there's, it opens up opportunities for a, a lot of work uh, and a lot of hard work. But um, the, the the sense of opportunity is is there, both at the political level and and at the um, the sort of the um, lifestyle, technological, commercial level as well. Um, I you know, uh, one American uh, leading American uh, said that this was just a distraction from uh, President Trump's troubles. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit sad to hear that because it's genuinely a historic um, change in the structure of uh, the Middle East. And that's uh, why we should be so proud of what we're doing. Thank you. Okay, and then my final question to you is, is even though we still have three more months before the year 2020 is over and we don't know what it may throw at us, I want to ask you how you'll remember the year 2020 and how UAE diplomats will really look back towards 2020 and see what the country has done, especially since our, our, our main, let's say, umbrella slogan for this year was this is the year to prepare for the 50th when the UAE celebrates yeah, yeah. its 50th um, anniversary since, um, you know, it was a modern uh, nation as the UAE. So how do you remember 2020 and how do we prepare for the 50th anniversary? <laughs> well, 2020 was a funny year because all of a sudden, you know, office office space didn't make sense anymore. Uh, so when uh, when we were all told go, to go back to the office uh, after having spent a few months away from them, uh, it uh, <laughs> it really made us wonder what we were all actually doing there, given that we could con communicate online. Uh, but you know, sort of physical presence is is um, symbolic and it's important, um, and so there there will always be some uh, room for that. But it did show that we can communicate uh, very very much more effectively online um, than, than we do when we're sort of walking around um, office buildings. So I, you know, that, that at the kind of a mundane level, I think is exceptionally interesting and important. Uh, what else will it be? Um, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs really got together to pull together, you know, sort of international cooperation under Her Excellency Reem Al Hashmi's uh, leadership, a tremendous amount of connectivity with countries that need assistance. Um, and that really built a lot of friendships that, uh, you know, uh, weren't necessarily there in the past. Clarified also for us who stood with us and who was, you know, a, a little more reticent. So that again, you know, times of crisis uh, clarifies relationships. That was uh, uh, important. Uh, young diplomats. I mean, there was a lot of there was over the summer there was a lot of questioning about well, you know, with COVID, is there any role for diplomacy? And actually, it turns out the role of diplomacy um, is there. It's shifted to a different format. Uh, it's no longer necessarily just taking care of of the local events. It's communicating with people, explaining, um, and and trying to sort of um, uh, increase the uh, the the, signif the significance of the Emirates for for different groups. So, um, I think young diplomats have been shaken, uh, but as I say, not stirred. Um, I think that that's that counts as a dad joke, I believe. 
Um, and uh, they are they're going to go back. They're going to go back to work, and they're going to have so much more to do. The realignment uh, from political uh, issues towards um, issues of, of around food and and health um, are going to have an effect on the way in which our diplomacy is also conducted. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Perfectly timed answer. We have come to a close of this um, conversation. I really appreciate your candid responses, Your Excellency. Um, safe travels. Wear your mask. Thank you very much. And inshallah, see you back in Abu Dhabi. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much.